a few minutes and then we're going to start the webinar and we'll also be recording it today. So just to let you know. Great. Yeah, we'll just let another few in. OK, great. Well, let's get started. Um, so welcome everybody to this gold standard webinar on adaptation today. My name is Laura Smith. I'm communications manager here at Gold Standard and I'll be hosting the webinar. And firstly, I am just going to give you a quick rundown of the agenda for the next hour. So if we just go to the next slide. Great. Uh, so first, I'll start with a brief introduction before handing you over to my colleagues, um, Felicity Spores and Abhishek Goel. And they'll talk to you about kind of gold standards take on adaptation and our recent initiatives. And they'll be also answering your questions uh, at the Q&A towards the end. So please do feel free to pop any questions into the chat as we go along and we'll have a conversation towards the end. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, the idea of this webinar came about because we've recently launched our adaptation requirements for public consultation. And these requirements are essentially a framework to help uh, project developers design and develop projects that reduce uh, risk and loss related to uh, climate events. Uh, and we want to take this opportunity to talk to you a bit about the new requirements uh, and the consultation, but also just more general about adaptation and its role in a sustainable and secure future and what it means, um, or, or the opportunities opportunities it could bring and is bringing in some of our pilot projects and many other projects across across the world uh, and also explain a little bit about the why behind adaptation and its importance and, and prevalence today and also why gold standard is moving into this space. So if we just pop to the next slide. So before I hand you over to Felicity, we've really got to give a big shout out to our partners on this project that is Resilient Cities Catalyst. So they were really instrumental in bringing this uh, project to fruition. And in particular, Jeb uh, and Shale from RCC um, were the key partners on this program. So um, we'd just like to give a big shout out to them because they can't be, unfortunately can't be here today, but they were really um, definitely big players in this. So without further ado, Felicity, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Laura, and um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody who's joining the webinar. Um, so I think, you know, when obviously we were looking at, at the need for a sustainable development impact standard to, to enter into measuring, managing adaptation. So, you know, we're an impact management standard. So I think it's important to remember that um, adaptation is kind of like um, adding salt to food. Um, if you use the salt container and just add it, it's highly likely you'll get salty food. So we normally put it into a container. And as a result of that demand for containers that manage the salt, um, you have tasty food. So, I mean, it's kind of trivial, but why is that important to remember? Because you have an impact. You have an impact on the food. You have an impact when you manage risk and you create demand for new products. So if you think of it quite simply like that, um, we saw in looking at adaptation, which is of course all about managing the risk of something that might happen because climate change is occurring, um, how do we address that and how do we drive maximum benefit? Gold Standard is trying to drive sustainable development impacts on the ground by identifying best practice approaches. And so I think what we we saw when we did this analysis, we thought, yes, it's really important is even if we meet 1.5 degrees, we're going to have to change some of the things we do because we can see that there are high costs to not adapting. The supply chains won't be resilient, there's flooding, there's tornadoes, and this has impacts on um, people's lives. At the same time, if we can address it and manage those risks and create demand for the salt shakers, you create positive development because you can create services. So the statistics on this slide show you that, that the benefits that can, that can be accrued by investing in adaptive practice. So in low and middle income countries, the World Bank found that resilient infrastructure yields four dollars of benefit for every dollar invested. So I'm I'm Felicity, the head of sustainable finance. I should have introduced myself, but you know, so I have a finance focus. 
and and so this is really key to getting investment into adaptation. Additionally, you can see that by investing, you have a benefit ratio of one to 10 through forecasting. So there's not only the demand for products or new job opportunities created by doing adaptive things, but also the services that help us get better at predicting risk can also drive great investment and can, can foster opportunities for development. And finally, of course, it creates opportunities for growth and employment. If you're adapting infrastructure, the construction opportunities or the new tools that are required generate new jobs. And this was these facts, 650 new jobs in India for every 1 million invested in adaptation infrastructure, just alone in the construction sector. And the other figures, 200 in China, 160 in Brazil and Indonesia, 120 in the Russian Federation. So as part of the why is gold standard doing this, it's because we see it drives meaningful sustainable development impact and therefore is true to our mission to manage and measure and maximize sustainable development outcomes. So then the next question we ask ourselves is, uh, is do we need another requirement or a standard? Is it necessary? What's out there? And when you first look, it's quite overwhelming. There seems to be an awful lot. So initially we thought maybe we don't need to, maybe gold standard just needs to recognize an existing standard. What we found out, and you can see this from this sort of topography, that that many adapt adaptation frameworks and standards um, and requirements are based around planning. So um, we identified five separate categories, the first being um, national level re resilience assessment frameworks leading to the NAPAs, the National Adaptation Plans and Actions um, by the UNFCC, that's the United Nations Framework for Climate Change and Convention, um, or the EU uh, European Union Taxonomy. Um, or we saw that there were frameworks targeting specifically citywide outcomes or community, very much focused on people as a community becoming less vulnerable. And here we see the ISO standards and additional standards, um, performance standards, like working at that jurisdictional level. Then there's quite a lot of work done at city level. Again, it's a planning tool primarily um, and some standards, specific standards for cities' needs. Um, but this is, of course, then excluding rural or non-urban environments. Um, then there's a kind of whole category which are very specific for the construction and building sector, included here are BREEAM con uh, construction standards, there's uh, the, the standard green light standards, there's the whole array of building standards which are also incorporating very good adaptive practice requirements. And finally, we identified, you know, standards that are really there to mitigate in the face of specific hazards. So all of this is great and very important, but what we felt was missing, and particularly because, you know, as head of finance, I'm looking to understand how to drive money to uh, invest in adaptation. Um, money invests not in cities, rarely, it invests primarily in projects or portfolios of projects. And we felt it would be important to identify project opportunities for adaptive practice that are also holistic. How do we identify those activities for adaptation that also drive sustainable development? And when we did our research, we did find two standards that exist that do take a holistic project level approach. And these are Envision, and sure. Envision is uh, developed and managed by the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure at Harvard University. It's primarily applied in the US um, and is a very good standard, but it requires an extraordinary amount of data to be uh, sort of certified to get you through the system. It has 64 indicators and high standards for data, which is why at present it's primarily applied in the US only and would be very hard to apply in low income country context, which is primarily gold standard audience um, in exploring um, what, what role we could play. There's also SHOR, which is developed and managed by the Global Infrastructure Basel, the GIB based in Switzerland. Um, and SHOR is also um, a, a, you know, a very useful tour, a tool, but it's primarily again focused on large infrastructure. It's missing the sector diversity. So we decided, yes, there is need for another kind of adapt adaptation requirement or framework, which can be applied by jurisdictions, so cities and owners, but who owners who have perhaps less 
access to data or less money to get that the data needed to do the risk assessments. We wanted it to be versatile, so applicable in both urban, rural, agriculture and natural habitat environments. And we really wanted to ensure that as a process of doing or building out or conforming to the requirements, capacity building needs would be addressed, which means how do you translate the plans from the national and city level into project investment opportunities? We wanted to explore how could we drive that. So our standard, our requirements that we have developed with RCC um, are really addressing those gaps, which is we're trying to lower the cost of doing adaptation to, to generate broader uptake and simultaneously advance capacity building for those that participate or use the, the requirements. We want to make sure that we address unusual um, adaptation areas like agriculture or peripheral agriculture and learn what that might mean for adaptive practice. And we want to make sure that we can address low income communities um, and systems. And we want to accelerate the uptake of adaptation, i.e. the capacity building component is very key in our requirements. So just a little bit of background to how we got there. Um, we can't just define a requirement and say that's good. There's a process and we're part of ICEAL, which um, is best practice for standards. So we 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 spotted the relationship with RCC and we agreed there was this need and um, Resilient Cities Catalyst um, have been really, as Laura indicated, instrumental in uh, developing the requirements as experts of resilience and adaptation. Um, in order to drive this and explore how to do this well, we, we worked um, with Resilient Cities Catalyst and um, advised from an independent technical advisory panel where individuals from EBRD, from CAF, from Climate Policy Initiative, ICLE and others in their individual capacity provided expert input um, into the development of the requirements. We have completed to date two pilots. One was in Pittsburgh where data was easy so we could test the actual fundamentals and principles. And then one has been applied in the Galapagos on an ecotourism project where data was less easy to get hold of. Um, and we were trying to see and, and again, test our assumptions and principles. Um, why am I telling you that? Because we are, are looking to continuously learn. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of data needs and adaptation. We will not get it right straight away. Um, and your participation and input will help us achieve the goals that I think are relevant for anybody interested in adaptation. Uh, and that brings me to the point, and Laura will come to it, we have uh, launched a public consultation and I hope all those on this call or listening later on the recording will um, have a look and provide inputs to make us help us help you make it better. So before I hand over to Abhishek, I'm, I'm not sure because we don't know really who's on the call, the level of understanding, but before we talk about the requirements, it's key that there's a very basic understanding of what it means to to implement ad adaptation, pr adaptive practice or um, to identify adaptive projects. And it's fundamentally about risk. And, and what is risk? Risk is the probability of a negative impact occurring. So damage, losses, death, service interruption of a train or cars. So it, it's combined of three things, which is the probability of a hazard happening, hazard probability, vulnerability, which is the tendency to be affected by a hazard or a trend. And vulnerability is a little bit complicated because it has two components. Its vulnerability is determined by looking at the sensitivity, i.e. what is the susceptibility of be human beings like you and me uh, being affected or, or the, the infrastructure environment. How, how lightly is a climate hazard going to negatively impact them? The next one is the lack of capacity to respond. And those two components, sensitivity and adaptive capacity, make vulnerability. And of course, then there's exposure. What's the level of contact with a hazard or event? Does it occur once or twice or how often does it occur? So, so if you think that through, let's take a flood, which probably most people can visualise, that's a flood shock. So the hazard probability would be, for example, for a housing or a city area, 10% of those people uh, hazard probability, the 10% of that flood occurring in the next 50 years, there's a 10% probability. So you'd first work out how often or how likely is a shock going to occur. And then you can consider exposure in terms of 
um, people who are very highly exposed would be people in the river basin, uh, basin. So that would be 100 houses. And then vulnerability, let's just say that of those 100 houses, 90 are not flood proofed. So then they're sensitive. And in terms of adaptive capacity, unfortunately, only 80 of those 100 houses have insurance or qualify for support if their homes are damaged. So I just think it's important to think that through before we look at the, the requirements and important to hold that in mind when, when you read through our requirements, because we need that combination of tools or understanding in order to understand what the risks are and to make informed decisions about what can be done. And now I'd like to hand over to Abhishek, who will talk you through what the requirements look like in a sort of generic way. Abhishek, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Felicity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this, this is Abhishek Goel here. Um, I'm working as Senior Technical Director in the Sustainable Finance team, uh, which is, you know, which was involved in development of, of these adaptation principles and requirements. Uh, so in the next two to three slides, and I will take you through like very briefly through the key principles you know, that we adopted before we uh, <clears throat> develop these, you know, these adaptation requirements. And also then briefly, I will talk about the, you know, the key components that we cover in these, uh, in these requirements. So goals and for the global goals, which is the overarching goal standards, you know, standard uh, in which uh, these adaptation requirements, you know, will set. So this GS for GG, you know, our core standard uh, has like uh, four, you know, four key principles: uh, stakeholder consultation, engagement, safeguarding, which includes human rights, health and safety, corruption, and, and you know other safeguards, gender equality, and contribution to at least three SDGs, out of which uh, SDG 13 is mandatory. So, so, so we reference these, you know, four um, key principles of gold standard. Um, and then you know drafted the uh, the principles before we started write you know the adaptation requirements. So we uh, so we came up with five key principles that have been uh, you know uh, been the backbone of writing these uh, these requirements. So the first uh, one being uh, that you know we we are developing a science based and adaptive management approach. So this adaptation framework you know uh, is really a adaptive man management you know approach. It really stresses a lot upon stakeholder education on climate change and adaptation. It uh, further, you know, stresses on uh, integrated local planning and design and resource allocation. Uh, focuses on system-wide climate risk management and and then you know also advocates for uh, investment in local cap capabilities and institutional uh, capacity. So you would see in the next slide, you know, how these principles are kind of embedded in the in the key requirements. Maybe, maybe you know, uh, probably this this slide may, might not be very clear. Uh, so, so what we did was uh, we we broke we broke down you know the uh, the the requirements into five key chapters. So the first one being the project definition brief and the team formation and qualifications chapter. So un under this uh, under the requirements in this chapter, the applicants of these requirements are you know required to first define the project. Uh, Basically, defining you know the the project technology and the boundary very clearly. Uh, also, reference the various data sources you know that would be used to to identify the the current and the future climate hazards that the project might be exposed to. And then, uh, convene a team you know which we should minimum have a climate adaptation lead and a climate science consultant along with a local development consultant. So, so this is one of the unique requirements in the gold standard, you know, where, where some requirements on the team qualifications have been you know, laid down, which is unlikely you know, in the other requirements that we have developed before. So, and then moving on into the next chapter, which is around climate focused stakeholder education. So here, uh, first of all, the applicants are required to identify the relevant um, and the affected stakeholder groups, uh, which are called the you know, reference groups, do do a you know a climate uh, science based education sessions you know with this with this reference group, and then uh, figure out a, a reference group you know which would be uh, consulted on a more ongoing basis. So so you know you can't like consult with a big stakeholder you know group every time. So what you do is from these different stakeholder groups that you identified. You create a reference group which will have a representation from these various stakeholder groups and then you know you consult this reference group um, in, in, the, in the next steps you know of the of the application of the standard 
So once this this group has been identified uh, and you know uh, the, the basic uh, education sessions have been imparted, uh, on a desk base, you know you develop you do a hazard analysis. So in this analysis, you will identify various climate hazards that the project you know might be exposed to. Uh, and doing for doing this analysis, you need uh, you know your your current and future projections on climate hazards like climate you know temperature variation, precipitation variations. And another relevant climate hazards. So first, you do a desk-based review, a desk-based assessment, you know, uh, of the of the various climate hazards, and then also identify the exposed parties, like you know, which are the parties which are exposed to 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 these hazards. So with the combination of this analysis and the exposed parties, you know, you basically develop a desk-based analysis, which you then take it to the stakeholder reference group because your assessment is more you know desk-based, but but the ground reality might be slightly different as as uh, Felicity was mentioning about two pilots that we have done in Pittsburgh and Galapagos. You know what we found was that the the local stakeholders have you know much more refined knowledge of the climate hazards that the project might be exposed to. So it's very important uh, that you kind of you know cross check your analysis with the inputs from the reference group. And, and really ensure that whatever hazards have been identified, you know, are actually relevant and, and some which have not been identified, you know, uh, but could be relevant are included in the analysis going forward. So, so with this combination of desk review and the stakeholder, you know, uh, discussion, you finalize your hazard analysis. So after that, you do a risk assessment, so uh, which uh, Felicity, you know, alluded to in the previous slide. In this, in the risk assessment, you will basically use the hazards the likelihood you know of those hazards occurring and the consequences you know that those hazards might might have so with the combination of the hazards the likelihood and the consequences you basically give a score to each of the risk that is that has been identified for each exposed party so you will have a big matrix of uh, the hazards the exposed party and the risk scoring, you know, for that party for that particular risk. So in the in the guidance document, we have we have given uh, you know kind of like a process to follow and the scoring method for this risk assessment. So after after you know uh, you complete the, this step, you would have a comprehensive overview of of the various risk that the project you know uh, is, is is potentially exposed to. So now in in chapter four, what you do is. You, you then try to identify you know which risks are very critical for your project like the ones which you can't really you know ignore and need to come up with risk mitigation you know uh, strategies or need to change the design of the project to you know address those risks there would be other risks you know which which you could live with but need to constantly monitor uh, you know how the risk level may change for a particular risk and if that risk becomes you know pretty critical then you might have to adapt you know your your project design going forward so, so chapter four is, you know, is very critical where you sit down again. You would invite your stakeholder reference group to, to this discussion and you would discuss the risk scoring for, you know, each of the risk identified and based on the most critical, uh, you know, risk uh, that the project is exposed to, you would then fine tune your project design if you already have a design or will include this risk in finalizing a project design. So after this detailed assessment of the risk along with stakeholders, you know, you then are able to finalize your, your project uh, project design. Then in then in chapter five, uh, what you do is you basically move to the monitoring stage where project is implemented. You put up a monitoring plan whereby you, you check the effectiveness of the mitigation measures, you know, that you had put in place to, to mitigate those risks. So you will check the efficacy of those, you know, mitigation measures. Are they, you know, properly working for you or not? And then uh, for the risk, which you had not put any mitigation measure, but, you know, you had put them in a category of kind of, you know, a watch list. So you keep them, uh, you keep watching them and, and set levels of trigger. So if the risk, you know, crosses a particular threshold, trigger is, is you know, is, is uh, uh, coming in place. And then you will need to make uh, a change in your project design to further mitigate, you know, uh, that risk. So this is called adaptive management approach. You know, whereby you're not finalizing design in like in 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 one point of time. You're constantly monitoring, you know, your your risk um, as it evolves, and then adaptively manage your project to to you know mitigate uh, those uh, those risks. And then 
in chapter five, you know, we also we also like proposed to uh, to you know monitor your awarded losses. So so we also in the guidance document we have given you know, matrices whereby you can compute you know what is the loss that has been avoided by putting up these mitigation measures in place, and you could you know then quantify the the losses avoided in terms of say human lives or you know like money saved from destruction of your project. So. So, so this is you know the overall uh, overall steps in the project monitoring plan you know, whereby you do adaptive management, constant monitoring, and you know also an assessment of the avoided losses from the implementation of the project. Next slide. Yeah, so 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 on this slide, you know, you can see so this is a simple simplified diagram of how this you know this cycle flows through. So, so I've explained these steps in the previous slide. So first you do project concept planning, you know, whereby you define your project and the boundaries, you identify climate hazards and you select the right team. Then you move on to the stakeholder, you know, uh, consultations. You, you identify a reference group, do, you know, stakeholder education campaigns, and then, you know, sit with them to finalize the hazard analysis. After the hazard analysis is done, you do the risk assessment. Based on the risk assessment, you know, you identify the priority risk. You develop alternatives for the critical risk and then define targets for risk you know that can be managed and then um, and then define the trigger points to you know to to adapt the project uh, going forward and then implement the project constantly you know keep on monitoring how the project is performing and then keep on you know adaptively managing uh, your project so so this is so so you know so chapters as you would see they're also you know like written in a very like logical sequence like one after the other you know they they, they flow from chapter one to chapter five Yeah, and, and, and so and the way you know these requirements have been drafted is like so requirements is a much shorter document where we have tried to uh, like really restrict ourselves to the key requirements, which which are complemented by a very big document. You know which are the guidelines which help you to interpret the requirements more clearly. Uh, where we have tried to set the expectations on you know on various aspects on what is expected in terms of when you apply these these requirements you know what we expect the applicants to to come out with is defined in detail in the guidelines we have given also you know a lot of a uh, lot of nxs there which which includes all these tempest for hazard analysis for risk assessment for audit loss assessment and your monitoring indicators so guidelines is a much heavier document uh, uh, and requirements is you know is a much shorter uh, you know concise concise document but uh, to, to better interpret the requirements, you would need to also, you know, go through the uh, the the guidelines uh, document. Yeah, over to you, uh, Laura, for the public Great. consultation details. Thanks, Abhishek, and thanks, Felicity. That was really insightful, and um, I'm sure we've we've got a few questions in so far. But I'd like to remind everybody that we're going to have a bit of a Q and A now towards the end of the session. So any questions at all, please pop them into the chat and we can have a bit of a, a conversation. Um, but just before we do that, I'd just like to um, let you know how you can get involved in the public consultation and tell us what you think about the, uh, the new requirements. So as we mentioned, um, it launched last week on the 27th of October, and it's open for 30 days. So you have until the 25th of November to send your responses in. So you can access that in a couple of ways. You can scan our uh, fancy QR code here, or you can uh, just go to the link, which is I will put in the chat as well for ease. So you can go directly to there, whichever you prefer. And you can get a bit more details on that page um, about the the the, uh, the consultation itself and also the documentation that goes along with it. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to Felicity or Abhishek directly. Their emails are on that page as well. So let's um, see what questions we can we can discuss. So we did receive one in from Pedro at the beginning, which was more about his interest in uh, becoming a, a pilot project. Um, so maybe Felicity, you could give us a little bit of uh, uh, information on how that had that has worked with Galapagos uh, and the Pittsburgh projects, and kind of what what the time scale and, and uh, is for for a pilot project. So, I mean, pilots, um, we welcome them, but we are an NGO uh, that is a standard. So we'd have to joint fundraise um, in order to pilot that. So we can't um, fund a pilot, just to be super clear. Um, but what we what we'd be delighted to do, if there are people on the call who would be interested in applying the adaptation requirements, is 
um, to work with you to get that catalytic funding if that's what you need or um, by all means to reach out to us to support you in the application if you have funding you simply just want to download them and try it and we would recognize your work so um, the framework yes Barbara I see your question can the framework be applied to running projects yes um, it really can um, and we are very aware that if you have a running project you might not be able to get to as good as if um, you, you, you hadn't started running it but the aim is to actually also look at that retroactive application um, because we see that that's occurring all over people are making investments um, without considering adaptation properly and just to really go back to one of the points that Abhishek made, which was it was so interesting looking at the Pittsburgh pilot in America, where you'd think there would be data and, and you'd be able to predict what's happening using IPCC data on flood slides. And, um, uh, and, and what happened was the guy from the IPCC was in the in the stakeholder workshop and he could see that his data was not sufficient to help that area of Pittsburgh predict the danger they were in, the risk from the, the landslides. And as a result, um, and, and to come to the point, the power of local public engagement was to identify through conversation, engagement and discussion, risk based on real live people living there because they know the risk to their house better than anybody. And that empowerment is, is quite critical in filling the gaps. Um, that's not to say that science won't help us get there soon, but satellite data on adaptation is is really poor, um, even in America. So that's why the, the, you'll see the requirements placing such a strong emphasis on public engagement and recognition of expertise in situ, in, in the place where the stakeholder, uh, uh, stakeholder consultation starts. So just answer that question. Yeah, great. Yeah, we, we, it's, it's, it's good to emphasize the fact that, yeah, the stakeholder engagement is a really important aspect um, and that's, uh, that's featured in the requirements. Did you find, do you have any specific examples from the Galapagos um, pilot, something similar to do with a stakeholder engagement? Yeah, yeah, maybe I, I can take that. Yeah, yeah, Laura. So, you know, so a very similar thing happened, you know, with the with the Galapagos also, where, whereby, you know, some of the like, like very fine sort of, you know, climate hazards, which, you know, which were not visible in the data, you know, that was sourced from public, you know, public available literature. There were some climate, you know, hazards which, you know, which uh, we had not identified based on the test review, and and during the stakeholder consultations, people, you know, people uh, kind of shared their experience over last one to two decades, you know, how they are seeing some some changes in so so the phenomena called Garua, you know, in Galapagos, where it is where, where the mist forms, you know, during during the uh, cooler season, and and th there was some you know disturbance in that mist formation. Um, over, over the past, you know, like say ten years or so, uh, which no climate, you know, model was was capturing. But you know, we came to know about this through discussion with the local stakeholders that how you know that local phenomena is also you know, uh, or the, the microclimate is changing uh, over over the last you know like one to two uh, one to two decades. So 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 that's the local knowledge, you know, which which you will not uh, or the microclimatic knowledge, you know, which you will generally not find in the publicly available sources. And which you can only, you know, know from the local stakeholders who are experiencing that. One no, thing I also wanted to point out as we're sort of talking about that, because it occurred to me as we, we, you were talking, Abhishek, is to kind of also emphasize like who, you know, we, I mentioned at the beginning, we're trying to drive money to support adaptive practice, you know, like why do all of this? I mean, one is so that you can identify what needs to be done, but then the critical question is, can you afford to do what needs to be done? And I think the very powerful thing about uh, an annual monitoring that manages risk. And so, you know, we don't know when climate changes exactly how the climate will change. That's the scary thing about climate change. It's not predictable based on um, you know, data that we've got to date. We can't predict how it's going to go. And that's why the annual monitoring is so vital so that you can always assess, you know, are we doing the right thing or do we need to revise it a little bit? And insurance companies are very, very keen. So one thing that we're seeing is, you know, gold standard is known for certification, but actually sort of being able for an insurance company to see that you are implementing adaptive practice, there is interest in changing premiums for loans. Um, there's interest from companies, um, big multinationals who are very keen to ensure a resilient supply chain 
you know, will the supermarket always get the bananas they want from that supplier or will they have to diversify? They'd much rather stick with one farming uh, wholesaler or the communities they know. Um, how do they support that? They need to instill adaptive practice. So there is money for this. Um, we still have a long way to go to make that happen, but we have the financial instruments to also fund this. And that's really what we're trying to do and, and love to open up that conversation to anybody on the call who who has experience in getting funding for adaptive you know processes or how you're seeing the lay of of financing for adaptation I'd, i'll just kind of call out if anyone's got experience to share thanks felicity uh we've got another question in the meantime uh from barbara so any recommendations from the consultation so far on micro scaling data to the chosen local regions and she mentions apart from LSC, which is crucial, but might lead to more qualitative data that might not fit the risk assessment matrix. Who would like to take that? <laughs> I can take that. I'm sure do you want to take it. But on 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 we we weren't doing so much. Um, you know, so because because we're working in low income countries, this idea that you do a uh, you know, cradle to grave analysis with ex ante data is not so much the requirement. You do a very thorough risk analysis based on those kind of data that exist. We're not asking people to, to do it again. And then you fill the gaps through your stakeholder consultation. We put a lot of emphasis in the standard on ensuring you have an expert. So the first part is developing your team. And this is where the hardest thing will be for implementing our standard is does your team meet the credentials? And we know there's a lack of experts out there. So I think when we pilot this, we may have to think about pragmatic solutions where it's not possible to get the world's best adaptive expert, but we do need people who understand the data like life cycle analysis um, and like those measurements in order to understand how to apply it. But our view as, as Abhishek pointed out and um, the Pittsburgh and Galapagos pilots have already confirmed is that um, we need to sort of optimize the data that exists and as as you're indicating lca data with local knowledge because the the, the data is really quite weak um and, and so that's the approach uh, it's not requiring that that people do lca it's rather use what exists and then optimize it with stakeholder knowledge happy to hear what you think about it though thanks again felicity um any more questions um you can pop them in the chat. If not, I think we can wrap up in a couple of minutes. So let's just see if anybody else is going to pop a question in. Unless there's anything else, Felicity or Abhishek, you wanted to mention before we wrap up. Um, please, please read the public, read the, the, the documents and let us know if when you think about your projects or the activities you're familiar with, um, you know, where you think, oh, well, we'll have to have a deviation because in, in our forestry, agroforestry project, this couldn't work. Or um, we think that the shore indicator would be much better here. Or gold standard doesn't have to do things on their own. We we are an NGO who works through alliances and we're really happy to recognise other people's tools, other people's <laughs> indicators and put a gold standard joint IP stamp on it. So please um, help us make this better. Uh, is the request. We know that we are still work, we, there's still work to be done. So I would just encourage people to know that we we know that we haven't got it 100% right um, and your input and, and knowledge will really help us get there. Yeah. Great, very well said. Yeah, absolutely. No more questions coming in. So, but I'd just like to let everybody know that they will receive a recording of the webinar and a PDF of the slides. And again, if you have any questions, feel free, feel free to reach out to any of us uh, and we'll be happy to get back to you. Great, okay, I think we can wrap up then. Thank you everybody for joining and for your questions uh, and thank you Abhishek and Felicity for your time. Yeah, thank thanks you. Laura. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, thanks everybody so on the call. Take bye. care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye.